Impending death. Death can be ontologically characterized as the almost non-relational and inevitable possibility. It is an omnipresent, inescapable, but non-actualizable possibility of our being. Thus, it is an ungraspable but undeniable aspect of every moment of our existence. It follows that we can only relate to death in and through its relation to what is graspable in our existence, namely, the genuine existential possibilities that constitute our daily life. Death thus remains beyond any direct existential or phenomenological grasp, but it is graspable indirectly as an omnipresent condition of every moment of our directly graspable existence. Death is not a specific feature of the existential landscape, but a light or shadow emanating evenly and implacably from every such feature. It is the context within which the existential features configure themselves, a self-concealing condition for our capacity to authentically disclose our own existence to ourselves. Just as death is a phenomenon of life, it shows up only in and through life, in and through that which it threatens to render impossible, as the possible impossibility of life. Phenomenologically speaking, then, life is death's representative, its proxy. We can overcome death's resistance to our grasp in and through its acknowledgement. Death can be made manifest in our existential analysis by recounting that analysis in the light of the possible impossibility of that which it analyzes. Putting it the other way, our being towards death is essentially a matter of our being towards life, of relating or failing to relate to our being in the world as utterly, primordially temporal. What does this look like? For us to confront life as fully our own possibility is for us to acknowledge that there is no moment of our life in which our existence is not at issue. This discloses that our existence matters to us. And what matters about our existence is the totality of our life. We thereby come to see that we are responsible for our life, that our life is our own to live or to disown. Death's existence makes a claim on our life that is essentially non-relational, that cannot be blamed on the other. To think of our life as fated to be rendered void by death is to acknowledge the sheer contingency of its continuation. The hardest lesson of our mortality is its demand that we recognize the complete superfluity of our existence. Our birth was unnecessary. The course of our life could have been otherwise. Its continuation from moment to moment is no more than a fact, and it certainly will come to an end at some point. Authentic Being Toward Death To acknowledge this about our lives is simply to acknowledge our finitude, that our existence has conditions or limits. It is not self-originating, self-grounding, nor self-sufficient. It is contingent from top to bottom. But no representation of ourselves is harder to achieve or enact than this one. Nothing is more challenging than to live in such a way that one does not treat what is in reality merely possible, actual, or conditionally necessary as if it were absolutely necessary. Authentic being towards death is thus a matter of stripping out false necessities, of becoming properly attuned to the authentic modalities of our existence. This last perception most clearly connects representing our being to ourselves as a whole and including the possibility of our authenticity in our human everydayness. For an authentic grasp of our existence as mortal inflects our attitude to the choices we must make in four interrelated ways. We are beings whose existence is contingent. We might not have existed at all and our present modes of life are no more than the result of past choices, whose non-existence is an omnipresent possibility, so that each of our choices might be our last. 
with a life to lead, our individual choices contribute to, and so exist in the context of, the whole of the life of which they are a part, and whose life is our own to lead, so that our choices should be our own, rather than those of the other. In short, an authentic confrontation with death reveals us as related to our own being, so as to hold open the possibility and impose the responsibility of living a life that is genuinely individual and genuinely whole, a life of integrity, an authentic life. But we typically don't relate authentically to our death. Instead, we flee from it. We hold death as something that happens to others, to whom we relate as mere impersonal tokens. We encourage dying friends and relatives by asserting that it will never happen. When it does, usually hidden behind the closed doors of an institution, we often consider it a social inconvenience or a threat to our tranquilized avoidance of death. Although we may not actually deny that it will happen to us, we take actions to hold it off, fitness schemes, cryogenics. We regard death as distant, as something that will happen, but not now, and hence as an impending event rather than as the omnipresent possibility of our own non-existence, that impossible but unavoidable possibility without which our existence would lack its distinctive finitude. This tranquilized alienation is characteristic of our average, everyday, inauthentic existence. It suggests entanglement in a misplaced sense of the necessities of finite life. Part of our everyday inauthentic mode of being is that we regard the existential possibilities open to us and the choices we make between them as fixed by forces greater than or external to ourselves. We do what we do because everyone does. We displace our freedom outside ourselves existing in self-imposed servitude to the other. We are unwilling not only to alter that fact, but even to acknowledge it. The reality is that we alone are responsible for allowing ourselves to be lost in the range of possibilities that our circumstances have thrust upon us. And we alone are capable of and responsible for changing that state of affairs. Authentic being towards death is a mode of anxiously resolute anticipation. It is anticipatory because death, the impossible possibility, can only be anticipated. It is anxious because living in awareness of our mortality means to make choices in the light of an extreme and constant threat that emerges unwanted and unbidden from one's own being. Authentic being means to choose for oneself in the face of the possible impossibility of the end of our own existence. Our natural state is to be anxious because we are oppressed by being in the world. Death, as an ungraspable possibility, reinforces the fit between itself and the essential objectlessness of anxiety. No object-oriented state of mind could correspond to an existential phenomenon that utterly resists objective actualization within our worldly existence. To state it the other way around, apprehending our worldliness as essentially uncanny, as a mood of being away from home, is to apprehend the mortality of our existence. The internal relation between ourselves and nothingness binds our analysis of death together with the analyses of guilt, conscience, and temporality in the succeeding parts of this series. Death is essentially implicit in the ontological structure of care, as well as in the anxious mood that reveals that structure. But it lies beyond direct phenomenological representation. It follows that to acknowledge death philosophically is to question our sense that the ontological structure of care gives us a grasp of our being as a whole, as well as whether such a grasp is even possible. We can attain a proper phenomenological grasp of death 
only by conceding the impossibility of ever doing so. We cannot understand our being without understanding that it is internally related to something beyond phenomenological representation. We thereby invoke a broader context for the whole of our existential analysis, the requirement to relate every element of it to death, which is neither a phenomenon, nor which, phenomenologically speaking, can appear as a phenomenon or as the object of a possible discursive act. For nothingness is neither representable nor unrepresentable, hence it can be represented only as transcendental, beyond the horizon of the representable, its self-concealing and self-disrupting condition. Since this horizon is the nothing, then to invoke it as a broader context for the analysis of our being, in one sense adds nothing whatever to that analysis, for it provides no specific analytical ingredient in addition to the ontological structure of care. Nothing in the analysis of death implies that our characterization of care is incomplete. In another sense, however, introducing this relation to the nothing as internal to our being means introducing the thought that every element in the articulation of care is related to the nothing, and so must be reconsidered in its uncanny light. Thus, introducing this unthematizable theme of nothingness alters nothing and everything in our existential analysis. If the nothing really is the self-concealing and self-disrupting condition of our comprehending and questioning relation to being, then phenomenological analysis can only allow it to appear as it is by allowing the nothing first to conceal itself and then to disrupt its concealment in the phenomenological analysis itself by appearing within the analysis as that upon discovering which the whole analysis is turned inside out. Only in this way could an existential analytic of our being achieve the completeness that its condition allows and its object discloses by presenting itself as essentially incomplete, beyond completion, as capable of being completed only by that which lies beyond it. Thus, our being is revealed as essentially enigmatic and paradoxical. Our analysis of death thus shows that the earlier analysis of being in the world, while lacking nothing, is essentially incomplete and beyond completion. This rejects the idea that essentially finite human understanding is always capable of further and deeper spirals of articulation. Rather, it suggests that there is something essentially beyond representation in the being whose being is structured by care. Hence, something about us that is beyond the grasp of any conceivable supplementation or deepening of phenomenological analysis. The function of this analysis of death is thus to disrupt the apparent completeness of the concept of care, thereby allowing our ontological analysis to represent the self-concealing and self-disrupting condition of our being and of its relation to being itself. The peculiar way in which this analysis of death alters nothing and yet everything in our analysis successfully represents our essentially enigmatic relation to the nothing that is death.